in order to examine the root of something, you have to be willing to kill it or, or willing to realize that it was already dead. So you have to, to examine a root, you have to pull something up out of the ground and either you see that the roots are either not there, it was not rooted at all, there, were, there are no roots, the roots are completely dead, or it's real and the roots are there and you can put it back in the ground and it can survive if it's real. This week on The Life After, we're talking with Derek Webb. If you aren't already familiar with him, Derek is an accomplished solo musician, a former member of the band Cademan's Call, which was a wildly popular band among evangelicals in the 90s and early 2000s, selling nearly one million records. As a solo act, Derek has always been a controversial figure in Christian circles. He was often a confounding mix of theologically conservative and socially and politically liberal. With each new album and single, Derek stretches and challenges his audience, whether it's using the word whore in a worship song or challenging the church's homophobia by criticizing Westboro Baptist pastor Freddie Phelps. Derek has never been comfortable being a conventionally safe Christian artist, even unto challenging our use of the word Christian as an adjective. Most recently, Derek has released his new record, Fingers Crossed, on which he chronicles what he calls his two divorces. His literal divorce from his now ex-wife, musician Sandra McCracken after an affair, and his recent figurative divorce from God and the Christian faith. Knowing that his departure from Christianity would ruffle a lot of evangelical feathers and potentially alienate a large portion of his core fan base, Derek decided to do something that I find very brave and vulnerable. He allowed his fans to talk with him about their responses to the record, whether good or bad or anywhere in between, in the form of 10-minute phone calls. Derek recorded the phone calls and combined them to publish in the form of a podcast called The Airing of Grief, the second season of which is currently in the works. I've listened to both the album and the podcast and find them captivating, cathartic, and insightful, just like the man himself. Here's our conversation with Derek Webb. Hey, Brady. Hey, Chuck. How are you doing? I'm doing great. What what show was this? <laughs> the life after. <laughs> we're we're here in Nashville, and I'm really I'm really yes, afraid. We're on the road. I'm really afraid that I'm going to do a fake Twain and just be really offensive. It's fine. <laughs> it just happens. They understand. They they understand. They, it's good. They get it. The Nashvilles. Um, At fake Twain needs to be a, a Twitter account that you now start. Oh, I like that. Yeah, that that is that is basically all the things that you are fearful of, of doing in the next few minutes. Like, but just doing it, mm. just let it uh, all like, out. Be in that. We'll find that voice. The, the and go all the way. The anonymity will will definitely work for you. Fake, Fake Twain. <laughs> it's just like Shania Twain yeah. lyrics, but just a little different. Yeah, there yeah, are yeah. so many different random places you could take it. Uh, by the way, you all are hearing a third voice today. Yes, that is. Oh, sorry. Oh, you're fine. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome hey, to the show. We'll, we'll air our grief later. Derek. There you go. Oh, 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 teaser. Yeah, here we go. Which, by the way, here I, we go with the puns. I always pictured you living on a farm, <gasps> like a big farm, like um, like forty acres oh or something. God. There Brady. you go. Hey. See, I didn't see that coming. I didn't see it coming. Hey. He, saw, he saw it coming. He well it coming. done. I didn't see it coming. Well yeah. done. Um. Derek Webb, welcome to the show. Hey, thanks. <laughs> <laughs> Derek Webb, formerly of Cayman's Caden, Call. That's right. Uh, mm-hmm. For those of you who, uh, <laughs> everybody if you want to Google the pun, to this show what, got that reference. What year did you leave Cayman's Call? Or, and it was kind of like a process for you from what I've read, right? That's right. I mean, I we started the band in 92. Okay. Because I'm, I'm old as fuck. Mm-hmm. Um, but um, <laughs> no, anyway, so we started the band in 92. We were all... I was right out of high school. We were mostly around that age, early college age. Oh God! In in Texas and Houston, mostly. Mm-hmm. And it's what I did instead of college. I mean, I I went right out of high school. We started the band, and I was in the band until the er, until early two thousands. And so it was probably two thousand two thousand one. What were you gonna say, Chuck? Uh, I was just gonna say it's you've come along. <laughs> Oh long my way. God! I know it's a it's, a, it's a totally. Then. This I, is that you live a different life. It's a weird now. way to start. Um, right, but it's yeah, the only Cape, it's the only way to start. Cayman's I mean, call to I know present. I know. I mean, it's it's uh, yeah. It's just it just show like it just shows you how fascinating life is when you look at it 
over a long period of time. It's like, you know, right. life is long and so for, insane, unpredictable things happen. Right. So for, for anybody that's not totally, you know, that's not following the, uh, the Derek Webb Twitter feed constantly, um, oh or, or just hasn't checked the, the uh, Christianity Today or Relevant Magazine recently. <laughs> Relevant Magazine, Jesus. <laughs> um, Derek has recently uh, released a record that is about his deconstruction, his sort of... Uh, I guess you could call it a departure from the Christian faith. I've kind of called it my A Tale of Two Divorces. Right. Beautiful. Kind of heard a vertical yeah, horizontal. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Absolutely. But yeah, it's also about a, it was, your it, actual yeah. divorce. Because my marriage broke up and then also right. I kind of left the faith and all that happened around the same time. We find same. that those things happen at the same time yeah. often. Welcome to the Ex-Husbands Club. I don't. <laughs> That's what we're I, renaming yeah, the podcast. I mean, yeah. definitely my own story is reflected yeah. in, that, in that way. And I, think, I totally resonated with parts of the album in that way. Yeah. For sure. I think the reason that happens is because I mean, I think there's a there's a, I think there's a there's a uh, a reason that would seem easy to my ears from a Christian perspective of saying, oh well, I mean, I I understand how a, a, an evangelical would hear that fact, like oh you went through all that at the same time, that's because that's because you're fucked and that's because your life's falling apart and mm-hmm. that's because you're, but but. Um, in my opinion, like the reason that tends to happen is because when you are going through a hard thing and your muscles are kind of warmed up to loss right, and right, grief right. Yeah. and you're kind of like, you start to, you start to like, or there's at least the opportunity to examine other things during that time. And it's almost like rolling in you know, a new kitchen floor to a mortgage. It's like, I'm not really going to feel it or notice it. So right. I might as well just do right. it. Right, right, right. And it's right. like, okay, That's I'm already going through way. this intense, overwhelming grief and pain yeah. and loss. Yeah. W- w- is there anything I can kind of go ahead, like any amendments on the bill that I can just throw in there and just kind <laughs> of go ahead and process this, those now too? Let's get this out of the way as yeah. fast as possible. Yeah. But you know, like, like let's see what else, what else, what yeah. else can I examine right now? And it's like, so once you, so it kind of makes you um, a little risk tolerant in terms of Mm -hmm. examining the the fixtures of your life. And so I think it was around a time where I wasn't finding a lot of comfort in my spirituality Mm -hmm. and I was being wholesale abandoned by my spiritual community. Right. So I was like, you know, probably not a bad time to like, you know, like take stock and see what this is about. And like how it's been a while since I've really examined this to find out if it really rings true to me right Mm -hmm. now. Mm -hmm. And it's kind of like what we were talking about before about like, you can't assess the, the quality or safety of the boat you're in while you're in it. Mm -hmm. And so I was like, I, I, I've been very highly incentivized to believe that this could hold my weight and was equal to the waves because I've been in it. So I have to tell myself that it can bear what I'm going through. Mm -hmm. But once, if I can give myself a second to step out of it and really look at it objectively, Mm -hmm. like it's like the idea of being, in order to examine the root of something, you have to be willing to kill it, or or willing to realize that it was already dead. Mm -hmm. So you have to to examine a root. You have to pull something up out out. of the ground, and either you see that the roots are either not there; it was not rooted at all. There Mm -hmm. there are no roots. The roots are completely dead, or it's real and the roots are there and you can put it back in the ground and it can survive if it's mm-hmm. real, but you have to be willing to kill it to do that. So right. the, the, the stakes are very high. And so at that moment I was like, this doesn't seem to be working or comforting or, or keeping any of its promises to me. So why don't we go ahead and examine that too, while I'm going through all the rest of this shit. Sure. And so as I started to look at it, I just, yeah, I, I think that you realize, I think that can happen with a lot of things. I mean, it happened with my sleeping schedule, with my diet. I mean, I threw everything onto that bonfire uh-huh. and said, uh-huh. let's just see once all of the, once it's all burned away, let's see what's left on top of the rubble that was real. Right, right, right. And let's start from there. I totally, yeah. I and I think that's why that happens. That, yeah. I think that when you go through a trauma in one place, it, it tends to kind of warm you up and and loosen you up in order to feel like you can bear looking at other things Mm -hmm. and examining those things too. And sometimes that's why a lot gets done at once, you know, like a lot gets pulled into a moment like Uh that Uh because you're like, all right, like 
let's what else then? what else isn't like, yeah what, what else wasn't how i thought it was it's, gonna, it's like, burning it's burning hot let's let's see what else yeah <laughs> it's like redecorating your house you want it to reflect you and so you started with one room and you know <laughs> then right. you start to put your own like taste into it and then it starts going to everything it's like, oh, all of a sudden this one room feels mm. like very resonant and very like it reflects me but it makes the rest of the house feel upside down yes so now everything has to adjust around this now this is my new non-negotiable and now everything has to adjust I have to reassess everything in light of this new fixture Mm -hmm. and that's kind of what happens yeah people love to race up and down my street (laughs) but that's kind of what happens and i think that's what happened with me i think it happens a lot i mean i think that that you know like people go through one bit of trauma Mm -hmm. Mm-hmm. And they just kind of pull a lot else. They're like, "Oh shit, here we go!" And you start grabbing stuff and like, "Let's just let's just do it all. Let's yeah. do it all right, right. now." Right. Mine right. was going through Christianity and leaving, and I was like, "I'm gonna come out as gay too. Yeah, Why right, not?" Right, right. But, but 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 honestly, yeah. that's like a moment where you're like, "Yeah." If we're doing this, rather than me do a series of mm. mid-sized traumas, yes. let's do one big one, one big trauma, and just, and just get, get it done it all at once and, and just, just sort some shit out. And- because because it because it. And what I don't want to say is that it lends itself necessarily to spiritual deconstruction. I don't think it does. Uh I think it lends itself to a moment of vulnerability and honesty and taking Mm. stock. And some of my friends go through it and find themselves doubling down on that. And that's okay. Absolutely. You know what I mean? And and here's the thing. If, If things are, there's no such thing as bad information or good information. It's just information. There can be disruptive and problematic information. Right. But data is data. Right, right, and so right. for me, it's like, I w- okay, now I want to know what I can know. <laughs> and I need to know it all like as soon as possible. So I went into research mode. I'm like, okay, uh-huh. well then what? And does any of this, I'm going to really try all this on and try it out and right. see if it, and I'm going to put it to the test. You, you know yeah, what I'm yeah. saying? Yeah. yeah, yeah and yeah. I just found it all to be lacking. I found it all not to be real or true or comforting. And I was like, all right, right. well, if it's not, then fuck it. Right. And let's find something that is real or true or comforting. And let's start from there. And let's pretend I'm an alien coming to earth knowing nothing. Uh huh. Yeah. How, what series of circumstances would it, would be required for me to come to a point where I'm suddenly getting to the part where Jesus is a person and made everything and runs everything. I'm like, I don't know that that's required for any of this to make any sense. Right. And I'm not sure I would ever get there. And if that's the case, why am I there? Uh huh. If an yeah, alien yeah. wouldn't believe this, then right, why would right. I believe it? Right, right. It should just be, it should stack its own set of evidence and it That's should exactly be right. right there. That's yeah. exactly right. So you find anyway. yourself in this, you find yourself in this like in between space, right? Um, and I feel like that a lot of the the writing, the, the like when you were writing this album, I feel like you were still kind of like, well, if God's, if God's real, he's going to reveal himself to me. That's right. If he's not, I actually I was documenting wrote, my I, way through. Yeah. Right, right. Yeah, you were, you were doing exactly that. Um, and I, I totally resonate with that. I actually wrote an album that I never released, weirdly enough, um, that was like in that in-between oh, space. Wow. So I totally relate to that. Um, so I want to talk about like your kind of process of like, you deconstructed your faith. You wrote this album. You released it. And um, I, th- I think like the first song on the album is Stop Listening, Stop listening right? Uh-huh. And it's about like, these are, these are the people that I've been with my whole life. These are my fans. This is my church community. These are the people that have been around me. What, will you stop listening or will I lose you over this right. process, right? I mean, that's essentially what it... Yeah, it felt like, it felt like the only way, the only respectful and loving way to start a record like this because it was like I have and and again I I don't want to sound for a second like especially for for maybe the majority of the people who might be listening who don't have a clue who I am I don't want to come off like I have delusions of grandeur (laughs) but there are people over the years who I have talked to I'm 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 self-aware enough to know that part of my job over the years has been to try and provide soundtrack for people in whatever season they're in. And especially sure. if they are where I am or have been. Mm-hmm. And I, and, and that's been part of my intention even. And I know th- I knew going into this record, there are going to be people who I have, and, and we have together gone through certain seasons of life, especially as it pertains to our spirituality, where for whom this record's going to be problematic because I have 
maybe help to provide some of the language and the shorthand that they now use to explain themselves. Mm -hmm. Okay. And like, you know, like there are people for whom these songs kind of helped them find it. it, It's really the, the thing I'm, I've always tried to do, which is like, it gave, it gave them, it provided a little bit of real estate on which they could exist. Wow, sure. I like that. Right? So it's like, if someone feels like I'm evangelical, I'm conservative, but I care about justice and I love gay people and I'm like, so in other words, I'm, I'm complicated mm-hmm. and I feel like I'm, I'm being told that I kind of can't exist. Right, right. right. You don't I'm told that, that my any, combo right. of, of, yeah. of, of, of characteristics is not a thing that can be right. real. I'm, I, I have tried to, I try to like, cause I'm like that. I mean, I'm complicated like that. Yeah. And I've always kind of been that way. And I've always hoped to be able to provide for people to not feel alone, for people to mm-hmm. feel wow. like, oh, I'm not the only person who feels this way. And it's sanity restoring for me to hear that someone else mm-hmm. is like that and has, and holds all this together in a way that feels like a contradiction. Right. And I've tried to always do that. And it's, that's how the the songs have felt to me anyway. But I knew that for some people, there would there there would be in maybe in their minds as they've wondered about the records I've made over the years. I, I'm I've been curious if there was a point beyond which they would not come with me. Well, you're, I, I was kind of thinking you know what I mean? about like, where that. they're like, like, you've always had the premise of the resurrected Jesus before I think this so. record. Yes, at that's least right. in the very there've been presumptions, and a lot of people can get on board with. Others like a lot of people can be like, I disagree, but I still really like your music because yeah. you have this premise. I've always but been when deconstructing you take away that, but right, up to yeah, a point exactly. that made me safe for a group of people because that because in their minds they could always say to themselves, and honestly, I said it to myself too. I mean, this is, I mean, I'm as surprised as anybody, yeah, yeah, that, yeah. That, that oh, the turns yeah, that we that I've taken absolutely have transpired, but like, for, I think for some people, it's been like, you know. I'm down with this deconstruction, but I, but I trust that he would never go past this point Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. where, where he would literally call. And, and, and I think that helped them to lean into and go with me because they, they trusted me to not go past a certain point Right. where I was Absolutely. calling yes. the actual reality of is God there is Jesus. Yeah. A yeah, person yeah. to follow. I totally relate to that because I was kind of that person in the church communities that I was a part of. I was always mm. one of the most like liberal sort of people that would put that would sort of push people to be like, "You've been taught this your whole life, but do you really think that that's the case?" But it was always with this premise of the resurrected Jesus. No matter how right. far I went, I was. And as long always, as people trust that that's unshakable, or that 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 that's the guardrail, they're willing to really go a lot of places. And right. it's really great. Right. And I feel like that's what me and my little tribe of, of supporters or fans or whatever have done over the years. Mm-hmm. But I, I knew that this record was beyond that threshold. I knew that it was. Right. I, I knew that this was yeah. the place where they were fearful I might wind up. Right. And what I appreciate about your podcast, you know, each episode oh, yeah. so, goes back to one of so your So Derek is, yeah, we, we kind of jumped right into that. But so uh, part of the thing that I really like about what you're doing is that the you responded to that conundrum by having this podcast where you let people just sort of like cold call you effectively and yeah. say like, Hey, I listened to the record. I've been a fan. This is this is how I feel about it, and you just sort of react to it, which is really, I think, really cool. Yeah. What were you gonna say? But the Thanks. way you always start your conversations is now that we're on this call. That means that we either have something in common or, or not. not. And <laughs> yeah. Let's absolutely. discuss that. You absolutely. know. And, um, I, I I love yeah. that. And, and what you said something earlier too about when you're talking about how your deconstruction is perceived. Um, this is, well, evangelicals may look at this and they would say, well, of course everything is messed up because you're, you're fucked up or you're leaving right. the faith. Um, do you find yourself doing that a lot of looking at your actions through the lens as if you were somebody from that, from a different perspective yeah. or whatever? Of- I feel like I can understand, it, it puts me in a, it, it, um, it equips me with, an empathy that I don't think I would have otherwise to be able to understand 
how they how it must seem to them yes and how it must look to them yes and it makes their reaction understandable to me mm-hmm. and therefore not a thing that i have to take personally yes right. or that i have to and it, which is to say i don't receive any information about myself from that community in terms of their response to what i am now doing Damn. Sure. Yes. I don't receive any information from them. Okay. Mm-hmm. And part of what helps me to be able to do that is being able to understand it from their perspective. And I do, I empathize deeply. I get, I yeah. get it, man. You get where they're coming I, from, I, and, I, and I get how you must, you feel like you must respond to mm-hmm. me. And I, and, I, and, I, and I empathize with the distance that you now feel you must put between us mm-hmm. for your credibility and safety I get it. I really do. Yeah. I, I, I'm not that far removed from it. Right. And I still feel very... So Dave Bazan, I don't know if he's a guy that you guys know at all. I know Bazan, yeah. And he's a guy who I'm... I'm. He's a pal of mine. I'm a bigger fan of his than we are friends, but I'm... But we do, we have, we, we do hang out um, on occasion. And one of the things I've loved that he has said um, is that, you know, he if there's anything he's an expert in of the few things that he feels like he really knows a lot about and cares a lot about, therefore it's evangelical Christianity. Mm-hmm. You know, it's yeah. like oh, the, yeah. the theological belief of ev- evangelical still, Christianity. Yeah. You can totally and and I that. feel the same way. Like I'm very, I care a lot about that community and I care a lot about, I'm not dismissive of it. I'm not uh-huh. reactionary to it. Right. And I, I don't want to be a bull in that China shop right. at all. Yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. If anything, I want to be empathetic and I want to say I deeply understand and I'm and I I I understand you and I'm actually not trying to persuade you of anything. Um uh but but I do understand the pressure that you're under. Yeah. You know, because yep. when I talk about you know, you guys were talking earlier about how much, how ironic it is or how interesting it is that you guys will still have theological debates. Like uh-huh. you'll still like, right. like yeah, debate yeah. about theology. It's yeah. hysterical. And it's hysterical. <laughs> and I actually have always loved, I'm, I'm just, a, I'm wired like a fighter. I'm just mm-hmm. a fighter. I mean, that's just kind of how, that's my energy. But like, I love, and I've always loved talking about and debating about, uh, the, you know, theology and, and, and the Bible. And I've actually never loved it more than I love it now. And the reason is obvious. I mean, this, this. You can look at it uh, totally objectively. Because I don't have a dog in the fight. There's no dog. Exactly. So, exactly. so There's I, no I actually, I, I talk about it in the same way that I talk about, you know, um, the Star Wars canon mm-hmm. or, or Lord of the Rings mythology or Back to the Future, the semantics of Back to the Future and the fatal flaws in that story. Right. I, all I'm doing is holding right. a system accountable to its own rules. Yeah. But I'm totally deta- but I sleep the same totally at night detached, yeah. regardless of what conclusion we come to. So, I thought it's it- very frustrating to my evangelical friends cuz they're like, <laughs> "How are you why are you so cool about it?" I'm yeah, like, yeah, yeah. "Because it I don't it doesn't think ma- it, it doesn't matter to me anymore." There's yeah. a phrase that comes up in your podcast a lot and Chuck and I were talking about that on our drive down here is the I call it the, the Christian preface of I like what you do I disagree with you. You know, there's always like that. There has, and I felt yeah. like I felt this so heavily whenever I was evangelical Christian. I always felt like I had to point out, I don't just, I don't agree with you on everything, you know. And then going on, and and it it shows like, okay, I appreciate what you're in doing. In what other conversations in our lives do we feel as right. though we have to make statements like that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I hear your con- I hear what you're saying about paleo. I need you to know that I don't disagree. I don't agree with you on all of what you're saying. <laughs> right, right. And so I want to stay, I want to make sure that we're clear on our differences right, so right, that, right. I mean, I've, I'm standing firmly oh God, on the ground that I'm on. But, but I get it best. because you don't want to feel responsible for leading somebody astray. No, I don't. Whatever. And so for me leaving Christianity for a while, and maybe you can attest to this is I, I kind of kept it a secret for a while because I wanted to make sure I knew that I didn't believe that this was true because I was afraid that if I were would have like left Christianity for a little bit and came back, you know, then I would have been responsible for anybody who may have had thoughts to leave or even, you know, like responsible for that sort of thing. Yes. I've had so much good therapy in the last like Mm, three or four years that I am very keenly aware of where I end and everyone else begins. Yes. And Uh that's, that was hard fought and there's no way I could have made a record like this without that knowledge. Mm. Yeah. And I literally feel zero responsibility I kinda wanna to ask about, you about what anyone because... does with the information on this record. Right, right, right. I, I wanted to ask you about that because... It'd be crushing if I did. We have right. found that... Yeah, absolutely. And unhealthy. We have found that um, a lot of people 
this is going to be kind of a long question, but no, I'll, I'll no, get do there. it. So we f- we find that a lot of people in our we so we have a, a secret Facebook group that where people can be totally honest and it's <laughs> I growing. I love that you use a, a secret this, versus private or something it's, like it's, well, secret. It's, that's a that's a that's actually a setting where it's like it doesn't exist oh, really? outside. Like nobody can even knows it exists, right? Well, wow. they don't know who's in it. You yeah, 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 be, yeah, yeah. You have so you to be invited group. into. Yeah, it. We okay. advertise it. A yeah, we bit. advertise it, but, but have you have to be invited. But it's still secret to even see it on Facebook. Yeah. So. Um, and a lot of people sort of like when they first deconstruct or get there, they kind of recoil and they, they kind of hide and they do their own like private, like sorting through things. It's terrifying. And they, it is terrifying. It's absolutely terrifying. And they don't want to let people into that space. They think they're the only ones. Right, 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 right. And then, so, and you kind of did the opposite, right? So you, you started the, well, you, I'm sure you had a period where you were like very private about it, but you kind of, but kind of, yeah. no, you're right. I mean, where you're going is right. Right, right. But you started this podcast and you were like, well, here's my, this, I still let's, kind of let's believe do in it God. To the benefit. I kind of don't, yeah. it's possible. It's not possible. And you just kind of put it out there in the air. We had somebody recently who is in the right. process of her deconstruction and she kind of opened up to the group about this. And, but she's in this like leadership position. She's this, uh, mm. she's, you know, respected in her church. A lot of people, faith high. sort of, right. And she's afraid of like letting people down. So I wanted to ask you like, I mean, you, you let up a lot of people down by making this record, right? But it was also an, an authentic, it was also an intensely authentic thing to do. And you couldn't do mm-hmm. art any other way to get there. Right. So what, how do you... Yeah. How did you find like kind of a balance in that? How did you yep. decide to juggle that? So my only job description, I'm not and have never been and have always been very clear about the fact that I am not a voca. I've never ever in my most Christian moment of making art or whatever, I have never ever looked at my work or my role as being a vocational ministry position. Right, right, right. Yeah. I am a musician by profession. Mm-hmm. I'm a singer and a songwriter. So my only job description is to look at the world and describe it for you. Right, right. To look at the world and tell you what I see. That's my job, period. Yeah. So it would, for me to have not documented my deconstruction would have actually been a letting of people down. Right, okay. Because, yeah. so, so I would have been more disappointed and fearful disappointed in myself and fearful about my future if I had actually watered it down and gone too gently about it, that would have been more troubling to me than what I did do, which was, I mean, it, it was, it was, I mean, I'm, I'm sure for some people it was a bit of whiplash, but it's, it's actually the thing. If you've ever resonated with me, if you've ever, if you spent a minute allowing me to provide the soundtrack for your emotional life right. at any point, if you've ever put any furniture, you know, if you've ever populated any of my abstract poetry with your own emotional furniture and made it yours and cared about it and made it part of your story and soundtrack and narrative, then, then the thing that you actually depend on me to do is the, the same ethic by which I did the thing that you did resonate with is precisely the same ethic by which I did this. Right. And that is wow. to look at the world and describe it for you. Yeah. And which is to say, you know, maybe, you know, these, you know, these things, things don't seem to be, things don't tend to last and they don't seem meant to last even really. Right. And it's okay with me if we've run our course. And if the thing, if the reason you found me and liked me initially is the same reason that you're now leaving, which is the reason back to your question that I opened this record with a song called stop listening and it was basically an invitation for people to say it's okay it's okay if this is the point beyond which you can't go right and and the point where you need to like jump ship now that's okay with me like and i need you to be okay with it like i'm yeah. grateful for the time we've spent everyone has their own path to walk and everyone has their own line. path yeah. to walk and it's like if this is the moment where you need to you know where i've gone too far for you that's okay. I'm okay with it. And I want you to be okay with it. And go be happy and find music that does tell your story if mine doesn't anymore. And I'm okay with it.
extra, extra, read all about it. Why are you trying to sell a newspaper on our podcast? I'm not. I'm telling our listeners about the blog. Did you know that podcast is only one of the themes that we produce? Yes. We also have a blog on thelifeafter.org, posts about starting over after religious trauma. But don't you think you're being a little extra? I am extra. And you can read all about it on thelifeafter.org. But um bum so fingers crossed is the record. The airing of grief is the podcast and the podcast. Um, I've been so conflicted about it. I mean, I, do, I, it's the one thing I kind of like, like a, like a holiday, like a, like a Christmas album. It's like one of the, it's like one thing I vowed I would never do. I uh-huh. start a podcast. I just did not feel like it's the world talk needed. About your, it, it was weird to me as an artist that you had to talk about your art so much. Like people at people were like, man, I really love this record and that, and like this song really resonated. And you're just kind of like, yeah, man, okay, you know, because it's weird to talk <laughs> well, about your own art. And, yeah, well, that and, much. I, and I could and I could I could talk about that as a <laughs> as a, as a feature of the podcast, that was, which that in and I'm of not itself super was comfortable a really with. Brave move, you know. Well, <laughs> it was it was the idea of one of our co-producers, okay. to anchor the first season to the record, since okay. that's kind of how what well, lit the fuse on it. Yeah, yeah. But season two will have nothing to do with me, sure, sure. or my art, right? Um. But uh, anyways, the podcast, the idea was that there were a lot of people who, as they were listening to the record, their responses or the responses that I could intuit from them about the record seemed to really have nothing to do with the record. It, what it had to do with was, what, or what it was inspiring for people, what it, was, what it was causing was for them to talk about their own stories of spiritual deconstruction, the church, God, Mm -hmm. what, what it's like, it clearly struck a nerve. So my doing it, my, my doing it for me, my telling my own story about deconstruction and whatever else. No, everyone's response to the record didn't seem to be about the record. It seemed to be them being being triggered to tell their stories. Right. Mm. And as I was seeing yep. it, I was like, this yep. is fascinating that no one's reviews of my record. Like, yeah. I mean, I tend to think that there is no such thing as objective critique. There is only unintentional confession uh-huh. that everything yeah. is a Rorschach. Uh-huh. Literally wow. everything, right, right. Sure. literally wow. everything yeah. is a Rorschach is my, is my hypothesis. But, um, but I saw it so clearly when I would, so here's this record and I know what it means to me. And I know why I made it and here it is. Yeah. Everyone looking at it and critiquing it yeah. was all about their own stories yeah, yeah, yeah. and their own experience it's almost like, with what I was trying to document for myself. Right. And once right. I saw that, I remember remarking to some friends, like how fascinating that was that no one seems to be, but it just, just even as a narcissist, I'm like looking for anyone to give me feedback on it. Uh-huh. Is it good? Is it bad? I mean, I'm so close to it. <laughs> right. I, I'm, I'm looking, you know, when you first put something out into yeah. the world, you want to know what people think about it. You want to know, is it any yeah. good? I, I think it's good or else I would have put it out. Yeah. I would have kept working on it until I thought it was good. But right. I mean, so I think it's, I think it's worth putting out, but I don't know if it's any good. I don't know anything about it. Right. right, I, right. I'm the one person in the whole world who knows nothing about it because I'm so close to it. And it's a, a literal externalization of my, of my guts. Yeah. Yes. But like, I, so I don't know anything about it. So I'm looking to all of you fucking people <laughs> to tell me <laughs> and something just about wants it. To talk about themselves. But the only thing coming <laughs> back to me was everyone's stories. And so as I saw that and I was talking to my friends about, it, I was like, this is so weird, but I'm not getting any information about my record. What you know I'm what, getting though, no, go ahead. Yeah. Sorry. No, no, I'm almost done. It's like, yeah. what I'm getting is everyone's information about themselves and their stories. Right. And so what I remember this one friend of mine, Ryan Alexander, who's in a band called Civilian, who you guys should for sure get on your I've, podcast. That's the third time I've heard that this week. So yes. Oh my God. Thank you. Well, he should for sure, you should talk to him for sure because he would be such a, fa- a good conversation. He was saying, well, like, why don't you just follow those coordinates and let that be an ancillary piece of the art, you know, because wow. all my records seem to have those, like, here's the art, but here's what comes after. Here, here's what came after. Here's mm-hmm. what it... And sometimes it's a tour that comes or sometimes it's another piece of art or sometimes it's, a, I don't know what, or it's like a little documentary or a little film or a little bit of video. I don't know, but there's always something that comes like an aftershock. And for this record, he was like, maybe that needs to be what it is. Like, how, how could you do that? And we were sitting at a bar across mm-hmm. town and we, we were talking about it. He was like, why don't you like put up a PO box and let people write their story to you and send it to you. And I was, and then as we kept talking Technology gives all gives us all these risky opportunities. Why 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 not? Right. Maybe just like give people the opportunity to like 
Sp- like, why wouldn't I spend a few hours a week, 10 minutes at a time, just talking to people about it? It's huge. Like, if you have feelings about it, let's talk about yeah. it. And so that was my first instinct was like, okay, then let's say it's, let, let's just, let's start to put some parameters. Let's say, okay, it's, it's 10 minutes because more than 10 minutes is too much. Uh-huh. Less than 10 minutes is not meaningful. And I'll just, how about I'll just say, hey, everybody, if you want to talk, if you want to air your grief about either me and your frustration with me and how I've left you and I've abandoned you and I, I was a bait and switch because I set you up all this great theological language that now you use to express yourself mm-hmm. and, ta- and explain yourself and now you're frustrated because I've left you or your grief and frustration with the church or God or Jesus or whatever, whatever it is, how about since you all clearly want to talk about it, because that's the only thing I'm getting back from any of you is you, is like little weird bits and artifacts of your own stories. What if we did that intentionally and to the benefit of the whole? Mm-hmm. So like, yeah. cause for every one of you who would be yeah, willing yeah. to talk to me about it, there'll be 50 of you who, who, who wouldn't be, right. but would find your voice in one of these in one people. Of the other, yeah. And so I was like, all right, well, the, you know, let's find out. So I put up a thing and I was like, all right, I'm going to put up like, you know, 20, 10 minute opportunities to get on a phone call with me and let's talk and tell yeah. me whatever you want. Like come yeah. at me and be mad and scream or cry or, or shake your fist at the sky or whatever you want to do, but right. I'll do it with you. Right, right. And I'll, and let's do it together for 10 minutes. Yeah. And let's see what happens. That's cool. And my only, my only ask would be that you let me record it and I'll keep your name out of it. Like, well, I'll bleep your name out so it's anonymous, but let me record it in order to maybe share it with other people. Yeah. And if you're willing to do that, then great, let's do it. Right. And the response to that and then the story and what happened on those first few calls that I was recording was so overwhelming. And I was like, after just one or two calls, I was like, I immediately started, this is what I do, but I mean, I, I just immediately started reaching out to other friends mm-hmm. who I knew could help me make something out yeah, of it. Yeah. I was like, you guys, something's happening. And like, I've, I, I've been doing this thing where I'm taking these phone calls and I didn't know what I was going to make it into, but I'm recording them and you're not going to believe what's happening. You're not going to believe what people are telling me. Within the first three calls, I got a call from somebody who basically said, I am a pastor at a church somewhere in the South. I am both gay and disbelieving Mm -hmm. in God, Mm -hmm. but no one in my church community knows either of those facts. Wow. Wow. I am literally wearing two masks on top of each other. I think we got that email. But I actually, yeah, but I actually consider it a reverse mission field. I know this will not end well, but I'm willing to stay in it and do it if for no other reason to prove to these people that not only should you and can you, but you, like you are not only able to, but you are in fact loving someone and in relationship with someone who is super different than you. Right. You can do it. You have been doing it. That's wow. beautiful. God, and and I'm the embodiment insane. of your ability to yeah. do it. Yeah, yeah. Shit. And his willingness to sacrifice himself right. to to show that to wow. his community. Wow. And and he'd not he'd not told anybody that but uh-huh. me in this phone call. And you wouldn't believe and everything in between. But and not just that. Also people who are like telling me stories that were more than the normal person could bear in terms of their ability to stick around in those faith communities, uh-huh. but stayed yeah, mm. and yeah, said, yeah. I'm, but I'm staying. And I do still believe right. it was more complicated than I thought. It's not just yeah. deconstructed people and, and not deconstructed yep. people. Right. It was like everything in life as uh-huh. you mature and you come into more information about you realize is non-binary. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Like everything else in my life that I have discovered, everything from sexuality to everything else that's really complicated to talk about in public, but is true as the day is long, it's not binary. It's extre- It's a fluid turning knob and it's extremely complicated and it's always moving. Mm-hmm. And it's like... Every, all these people's spirituality and their stories are fascinating and not at all what I was expecting other than the fact that they desperately wanted a place to air that grief and to talk about that. It's beautiful. And so my friends and I started to curate those conversations by topic and then mm-hmm. release them. And that's what the yeah. podcast is. Yeah, yeah. These unedited 10 minute conversations, uh-huh. yeah. you know, kind of anonymous conversations with people about their, their spirituality right. and otherwise. And it's been fascinating. Yeah. I yeah. mean, it's just it, vulnerability begets 
vulnerability. It you does. Know, you make that vulnerable music Absolutely. that you, as you have, and that just has been a chain reaction to other people wanting to tell their stories and people to feel safe to do it. That's what I was thinking earlier when you were talking about like you made this piece of art and nobody's responding to the art directly. They're all saying like, and I feel like that means that it is. That means it's great art because it's a window. It's like we're in this studio and there's no windows in here. And you're sort of like, your art made people say like, well, wait, what's out here? Yeah, mm. or, like, or like what? Or at least, as I like, said, it's they, like a Rorschach, they, they, they at least for them. They look into the mm. art and they see... Yeah, exactly. Like a, it's a two-way mirror. They look into the art and they they're looking see at me, something but they're seeing else. themselves. Yeah, right, right. Well, and that's beautiful. That's, yeah. what you hope, that's what you hope it does. That's what mm. it can do. And once we realize that's what it was doing... Yeah. I was like, okay, well, if it's not about, it's clearly not about me uh-huh. and it's clearly not about my record. It is about our being in a clear, significant moment where there are a lot of people experiencing this all at once, none of whom are aware that they're not the only one. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. And that is an opportunity Yep. to do something intentionally for them for them to know that they are not alone yep, and to help do what the church did for them really well, which is, and we talk about this a lot on the podcast, which is to provide the church does this well, but also leaves you without it. When you leave it, the church provides a language and a shorthand to talk about your experience. And it provides for you a safe place to congregate, to practice your belief about mm-hmm. your experience. Mm-hmm. And, but when you leave, you suddenly are detached from all that and you're stripped of your language and your words and you're stripped of your safe place to congregate and you're stripped of your community, your people and your relationships. And suddenly you're completely on your own and you, and you feel as though you are the only one doing it. And, and in the same way that everyone is the star of their own movie and everybody thinks that, oh, I'm going through this so everyone must be. I, I, I want to be careful not to do that because I was like, because I, when I was first going through it, my own deconstruction, my own processing of this thing, and talking to some of my friends about it, I was like, oh, this must be a thing that everyone's going through right now because I am. And I was like, well, you know, maybe not. Maybe, you know, everyone's always gone through this and everyone's always gone through. But actually, I do think, but, I mean, you guys are, 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 a, uh, are evidence of it. And there's a lot of other great podcasts and a lot of other mm-hmm. online gatherings and online movements. And, and I feel like when I squint my eyes at it, it really does feel like we are in some rhythm of history right now. Yeah, absolutely. Where there are a lot of people going through this right now. Absolutely. It's not just us right now. Right, right. Sometimes it really is just in your head and you're going through it. Yeah. And it turns out you're just the only one really. I mean it's like you and a couple of pals. Yeah, it's a small spot. But I think there is is a a mass we're in a moment right now. Yeah, yeah. yeah, Where this is we are. We're happy this is happening right now. And once we all kind of looked at it and realized that um, and I realized, again, not about me, not about my record, n- nothing to do with any of that. It was just a, you know, a, a flash that lit a fuse. And what could, w- what's the opportunity here? Mm-hmm. Like, what could this art be? Because it started as just a self-expression. That's what it always mm-hmm. starts as. It's just a very vulnerable self-expression. Right. That's what it is. Just me telling, right, right. Like, me looking at the world and describing it for you. I mean, that's literally what this podcast is. The first, you know, five minutes of it are just Brady telling his story. And now right. we have this, you know, I mean, we have people right. listening now. You right. Know? Right. But that's what it felt like to me. And that's why it felt worth doing. And that's what, and that was the immediate response that we got, which I'm sure you guys have experienced too. But yep. people saying, oh my God. Like the thing that I hope as an artist, my records do in terms of their providing language and soundtrack for people's emotional lives to make them feel less alone. That's exactly what podcasts like yours are doing. Mm -hmm. It's providing for people some real estate on which they can stand and realize, and it gives them permission to exist. Yeah. It, I love it, that. I love that phrase that you use, the you know, real estate to stand, you know, just giving that space to allow you to right. build something different or build something sometimes new. insanity only comes from you're being squeezed out of existence, mm-hmm. you know, and, and, and I'll tell you who has really embodied that well is my pal, uh, Jen Knapp, who you guys, if you, if you haven't, Absolutely. I mean, yeah. you for sure should talk to at some point. Because when she was going through, and it's a whole other story I don't need to tell right now, and I've told before, but when she was going through her her coming back into the music scene after almost 10 years out of the country off the radar, 
and vo- like willingly coming back into it, self-expressing again, but bringing her whole self back in with the strength and the and the maturity of ten more years, where she felt like she could do it as a gay woman and um, as a believer. Still, she basically what she said was, "Listen, like I can't." I'm not here to theologically explain myself to you. Yes. I'm not here to say, here's how this makes doctrinal sense of my being this and this and this. What I'm here to do is challenge the, the presumption, it seems, that I cannot be both this and this. I mm. cannot be both attracted, naturally attracted to women as a woman and to be a person who leans on Jesus' redemptive work for my salvation right. and understands it completely. Mm-hmm. Right. Um, she's like, I remember her saying like, I can't even explain this to myself. Yeah. There are even parts of the Bible that are confusing to me because I don't totally know how to make sense of them in light of, but let me, let me tell you what I can tell you. I am the unicorn that you claim cannot and does not exist. Mm. I'm a person who embodies right. both of those seemingly contradictory things. Sure. I embody it. I am it. You can't say that you, I used to love and thought it was so nonsensical. The question of, can you be gay and a Christian? Uh-huh. Mm-hmm. I was like, are you uh, serious? Yes, there are. The, you're right. I mean, absolutely. like, how could you even ask a question like that? Yeah. And, but her answer was feast your eyes. <laughs> right, right, right. I, I'm here right. to tell you that you can be because I am. It's like if a scientist you know I mean? finds a new yeah. species, they can't go through the book and say, well, this isn't real because it's not in the book. I mean, book. I know I've got like a camel right. with a horn <laughs> and wings standing next to me, but let me tell you all the reasons why that can't exist. That's not real. Fuck your reasons. There it is. Right, right. Study, it's study standing me. next to you. Yeah. Study it. You know, and learn from it. Learn from right, it. Right, Listen right, to its story. It. Trace Change. its origins, right? Hi, everyone. I'm your co-host, Chuck Parson. If you are interested in getting to know us and other deconstructors, doubters, cynics, searchers, and apostates, if you feel alone in the processing of your doubt, if you are struggling to find direction after leaving religion, we have a very active secret community on Facebook. If you would like to join, please contact us at facebook.com slash thelifeafterorg. Leave us a message and we can invite you to join. And while you're there, you can also click the like button. We also have a website, The Life After Org, where you can access our available resources. If you are interested in supporting our efforts here at The Life After, look us up on Patreon and become a supporting member. And lastly, if you like what you hear, subscribe to the podcast and leave us a nice review on iTunes or wherever you listen to your podcasts. Thanks so much, everyone. To me, I think that's where it comes from. I think it's people's desperate need to control their environment and their realities. Yeah. And that's, that's all of systematic theology uh-huh. is let's bring it all into Bullet some points. lanes, white, black and white. Yeah. Let's, let, let's organize it into, into some lanes. Let's put some guardrails around it. Let's provide, let's get some good language that we can all agree upon to talk about it. And let's really understand it because our understanding of it, Make it, it like lends to its credibility and veracity somehow. Like right. our ability, and that's so crazy. Our ability to understand God seems to be the thing that makes God him real to real. some people. Yeah, wow. absolutely. But it seems like it should be the opposite. And yet, the thing that when you hear evangelism, so much of it for like a hundred years has been about apologetics and about persuasion and about here's how to tell a good testimony. It's like giving a good elevator pitch, right. you yeah. know. And here's like, but it's like. If you really believed what it says about itself, you can't, your persuasion is the last thing that could convert anybody. Uh huh. Right? Yeah. It's, it's mysterious. It's spiritual. I mean, you can't reach into my chest and pull out my heart of stone and replace it with a heart of flesh. You can't right. dig me spiritually dead out of the ground to right. new life. You can't do that. Right, right. 
a lot of our evangelical training whenever I was younger was if somebody says this, then respond with this. If they say this, then respond with this. And it's That's like, right. where's the vulnerability in that? Where's the the heart and what truly matters? And and yes, you get people who share their testimony, et cetera. But um, if it was more like classical and, and less like jazz. Yes. I it's like, like no, here's the math. Here's how it works. If you hear that, it's like being a telemarketer. If someone says this, here's the response. And now you're in, and it's like a flow chart. And now here's your, and here's how you say, but what it's not is like, let's dance. Right, right, right. You know, let's dance. Like, let's hold each other and and let's move and let's respond to each other and let's see where where that goes. I feel so much more Mm -hmm. like I can comfortably dance now that my beliefs are not related are not so ingrained in this dogmatic bullet point black and white like set of things that have to fit together a certain way and you learn so much more so much faster that way when you're able to say like oh i thought this but you think this and that is not threatening to me like let me just listen right well too much is staked on your being right about it right exactly and so the, the 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 key thing to relationship and growth and health and progression, a good Christian, and I'm very careful how I say that, is unable to do, which is to truly be in a posture to come into new information. Mm -hmm. There are certain things that you cannot revise your opinion about. Right. They are are in a lockbox. Yeah. And that is, we can talk about it, you know, it's like we can, whatever you want to say, and we can debate about, you know, how... God feels about gays and all, whatever it is. Yeah. But let me tell you what we're not going to talk about. Right, right, right. It, was Jesus a real person? Was he truly the son of God? Right. Is God really out there? Like yeah. there are certain things, there's a there's a line beyond which we and don't it's, question. And it's a, it's a handful we, of things that are very fragile and not based in their assumptions, you know? Right, no it's evidence. Like, it's like you could, count, you could quantify them. It's like 12 things That's that right. you have to believe in well, order to stack so 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 let's so let's do the Apostles' Creed. Right. Yeah. Exactly. It's the that's, Apostles' Creed. That's it. So I want to uh, I want to veer this convers I want to veer the conversation a little bit because you've had some uh, like listening to the podcast and listening to the album. You have some uh, some really interesting comments commentary on the Holy Spirit, right? So oh. so you have the Spirit bears the curse, right? Which was sort of for anybody who hasn't heard this song, it's I I kind I kind of don't want to spoil the punchline, the first line, but I kind of want to. Yeah, it's the it's the least the controversial song on the album off the record. And I had the <laughs> privilege, the least, which, yeah. Oh yeah, right. which is why I released it as a single first. I, <laughs> I had the privilege of of seeing like relevant magazine posted this single and what I had coup. the privilege of reading through the comments and some people were like, Oh, I was so into it. Now I feel so duped and it's and you know, I'm like embarrassed and like for the first but, three minutes, I was texting all my worship leader friends, like, we had to right, sing right. this this Sunday in it's church. New, in the last 10 seconds, I was like, so scratch the, that. So the, the premise of the of song course. is that Derek <laughs> sets it up it, like a very traditional worship song that you would sing on Sunday. And then at the end of the song, you find out that the whole song is about alcohol, which yes. is... It's like a it's like a punchline, and I feel like a lot of people will listen to it and it's say like, punchline. "Oh, he just wanted to fucking get us," you know. But there's something to that because you have the spirit who is this who you know bears the curse, who bears the burden. It's what you lean on. But ye, as you as you deconstruct and as you move on in life, you find out that there are other things that do that. And for you. I think it uh, was deeply confessional for me. People don't, I mean, I wasn't trying to, right. When it first came up, people were like, Oh, it's just classic D Webb. He's just right, trying right. to He's just deconstruct trying our to... conventions about like, Oh, look, he turned worship songs on their head. And I was he like, Dylan does. I wasn't trying to do that. Yeah. I was actually legitimately saying yeah. I found no comfort in one thing and found a lot of comfort in and another. another thing. Yeah. And so on your show, on the, on the podcast, there's a, there's a point where you're, you're sort of talking about, um, learning to trust yourself and learning to trust your body again, mm, right. which we've sort of been taught not to do, right? Not on your own. We, we like if yeah, yeah not, on your, not on your own understanding. Right. Whereas right? one translation says, "Don't trust yourself." And yeah. you said, yeah. you said, you know, I when I first deconstructed, I was like, "Oh, how am I going to learn how to make decisions? How am I going to learn how to discern and how and what I need?" And then you realized you've been doing it your whole life. You've just been causing, you've just been calling it the Holy Spirit, but it's really your intuition. That's right. right? 
And that's really, uh, that was really crazy. Like I sort of, I associated that with the spirit bears the curse because it's like, we build these system, we build this, this powerful system that relies on, on God and Jesus and the Holy Spirit and these beliefs and going to church and listening to worship songs and praying and crying and all this stuff. And then we leave that and we're like, what do we do now? Hmm. But the reality and, is yep. it's there. You just have to redefine it. Well, and, and the confusion for people tends to be... The the, the 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 immediate confusing things tend to be but what do i now do with all of those moments where i had that gut feeling like the spirit yes. showed up and guided me cuz yeah. look how it, look look at this this the whole season of my life was a result of me following the coordinates of the spirit and what what i feel like he he you know god was telling me to do and and what do i do with that because like if that's not all real, then what was that? And and also, so it's, that's one side of it. It's like, mm-hmm. what do I do now with the real spiritual experiences that I had? Mm-hmm. Um, right, yeah. yeah what right. do I do that's, with them now? How, what what yeah. do I call that? That's, and how yeah. do I categorize it, uh-huh. right? But then also, the other side is, how am I, what do I now do with my with essentially my stunted growth where I was taught from when I was, in junior high school to lean not on my own understanding and to distrust my body and my mm-hmm. gut and my instinct and mm-hmm. my, the voice in my head, like, cause I'm told that that's always going to lead me into sin. Yeah. Don't ever listen to what your body wants. Like that's evil as shit. And it's going to, it's going to make you do terrible things. So don't lean on your understanding, but trust the spirit. And so now am I going to, am I just going to be like a, like a train wreck because I don't know how to, uh, uh, behave mm-hmm. in reality because I've been dependent on this thing that's now gone. Interestingly, in my experience, again, everything for me, I'm permanently uncertain about all of this. Uh-huh. Yeah. Um, so everything's a hypothesis that, that's in a constant state of testing, you know. But in my experience so far, both of those things are answered in the same thing, in the same reality, yeah. which is that, first of all, what I do with all those moments where I was like, I just had this gut and the, the spirit showed up and it gave me some direction, some guidance and I did it and it worked out. And it was that, in my experience, the way that I understand that now, that rings very true to me, my practice of reality without the spirit, without me tapping into something external of myself for guidance that, that puts me on a path, yeah. so far, at least five years in, is precisely the same. Mm. There's no material difference. Mm-hmm. And as it turns out, I always thought that that voice sounded like me to me. Mm -hmm. And it turns out like I was giving credit to the spirit that like I, I, I needed to like that, that should have been part of my own esteem of myself. Mm -hmm. Like, man, look at you. Like, look at you, like being really self-aware and healthy and making good choices. Like, look at you, like, having a good instinct right now. Right. I think that, right, I think right. that's the right choice. Good. Yeah. Well, like way to go, way yeah. to go self. Like, <laughs> right, right. I think that's smart. I think that's mature. I think that's healthy. Yeah. Rather than saying, Oh, whoosh, whoosh, I'm such right, a piece right. of shit. Yeah, oh yeah. my God. I'm such a, I'm just, depressed. Like, everything about me is it, fallen and simple. I'm such a piece of shit. That way, spirit lead me and guide me. And the only thing good about me is what you are somehow accomplishing oh, yes. despite my total fucked up instincts about everything. <laughs> when it's you like, put it that way in that contrast, it's insane. Like, it's yeah. like, it took me so long to establish that hard contrast of yeah. like, I never, ever trusted myself. Right. And I had to trust God. Right. To like, I, everything that I do now is my own t- intuition. But as it turns out, all that time, all those moments where you were like, oh, Holy Spirit, you know, and I'm not trying, I'm not at all, I mean, I, I'm not at all trying to belittle or, or make fun of or be cavalier about people who call out and say, Holy Spirit, I'm not at all. Because right, right. sure. they could be right. Yeah. And I could for sure be wrong about this. Right. I really could. Yeah. I don't know. I'm just not persuaded that, you know, of it anymore. But it's like doing that all that time. It's like the, the, the thing that I equate it to that's been helpful for me is like, it's like all this time I was looking at a, at a broken clock and Twice a day, it was correct. Hmm. And if I would happen to catch it, I was basing my whole life on the two seconds of the whole day that I would look at it 
for information. Mm -hmm. I was like, oh my God. Yeah. It's look, it's right. right. It, it has information right, for right, me. Right. It knows something. Yeah. It's yeah, yeah. and I'm gonna I'm gonna stake my life on I'm gonna look at that right. and I'm gonna believe it has information for me. The majority of the time it seems it doesn't it's make any off. sense. It's off. It yep. makes no sense yep. with any of the experience I'm having. Absolutely. I have to believe that the broken clock's ways are not my ways. The broken clock <laughs> is operating in a mysterious way that I can't understand. The clock's ways are higher than your ways. The, the broken clock's ways are higher than my <laughs> ways. And so that's its pass for fucking everything. Yeah, yeah. But a couple of a couple of seconds of the day yeah. that I used to to subsidize and and justify all the other majority of the time when it seems to know nothing and have no relevance. But a couple of times a day I see it, I was like, oh my God, look, 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 look. Yeah. It knows something. Yep. Because it's right twice a day for one second. Hmm. Right? And I'm like, oh my God. It knows something, uh -huh. and what I and what you wind up doing is attributing all of that to the clock that's broken. But in real life, it's like most of the time, what I'm doing all the time, what I'm doing is ultimately making choices all the time. That I was like, oh, you know, what? I think I got it. I think uh -huh. I think I've heard from the spirit. I think I have a sense. I, I got some confirmation. I had a dream or I had a, an instinct. And now I think I know what I'm going to do and I'm going to do it. And I'm going to do it because I think that it's clear to me that that's what God wants me to do all that time. Guess what, everybody? Hmm. You were listening to your body. Yeah. You are not as out of practice at it. It is not a, as foreign. <laughs> it is not a language you don't speak and now must learn to speak. And it turns out you have not ever spoken. No, you've been doing it. You've been soaking in it the whole time. Right. When I was this in is, junior yeah. high, uh, you know, the girl that God was always telling me to go out with just happened to be the girl that I had a crush on. That's you know right. I mean, <laughs> Yeah, God the, told me to the, marry you. And yeah, subsequently, that, oh, yeah. the girl you wanted to break up with happened to be the you know, her just like a couple months God later. Just happened <laughs> yeah. to be telling them, yeah. telling you to break up with them. Yeah, right. But, that, but it's like so. Both so both the spiritual, the mysterious spiritual moments where the spirit was showing up. First of all, good news. That was you. It's so meaningful. Like, like you, you actually know yourself really well, and you make. Hey, guess what? And you also understand you the make world good around choices. you. you make good choices. You're right. You understand like, the world like around you. You, you, you you're doing a good job of listening to your body and yeah. trusting your intuition and respecting yourself. God, that's amazing. You're actually better at that than you thought. First of all, and second of all, like, so that explains all that spiritual. Like, what do I do with all that? Oh, right. that was you. Congratulations. Keep going. Keep keep it going. But also, which is the second thing of now, what do I do if I don't know how to behave i'm like a i'm like an infant in the world because i've spent all this time leaning on this thing that that was telling me how to do everything and Fuck, giving yeah. me all my guardrails i don't know what to do now your morality what do i do now all my morality and yeah. everything it turns out what's keeping you from murdering someone that's, that's exactly right, right. And, and you know what a better thing yeah. i have a better reason not to murder someone now than i did before yeah yeah rather than there being some external invisible unprovable personality D in the world <laughs> mm -hmm. That was the reason that I wasn't doing it. Guess what I replaced it with? Personal health and responsibility. Yeah. And yeah. guess what, everybody? As it turns out, the two decades I spent struggling, let's say, not to look at pornography, yeah. because I just didn't have a good enough reason. Mm -hmm. Once I was free of the, because God doesn't want you to, because he designed sexuality and here's the way it's supposed to work. And if you don't do it that way, you're doing it the wrong way. Yeah. And it's not fulfilling. Ultimately, although I was... No evidence was proving that in on in any circumstances. As it turns out, now that I am only making choices based on my personal health and responsibility and dignifying and respecting other people and myself, guess what, everybody? Like, I haven't struggled with <laughs> pornography in five years. Fucking bingo. And, yeah. and, and you know what? Like, what's crazy is right? how much more persuasive that is to my actual behavior yes. when it's about... Uh, the, when all the stakes are internal mm -hmm. and me respecting myself and mm -hmm. the people around me and taking ownership and wow, responsibility and owning, yes. my exactly. owning my behaviors owning it, and, yeah. just, and trying some things, experimenting and saying, right. huh, that's not line of sight to the man that I want to be right. or the world that I want to live in. Yes. So I just lose, I just lost my taste for it. Yeah. Yeah. You, like, you said it. It oh. happened in a second yeah. as opposed to 20 years of struggling. Right, right, right. Exactly. It's overnight, right? It's, so as it, it turns out, everything. the guy who made all this, arguably, within a year, I had all that shit sorted he out. Couldn't fix it. All my I behavior it exactly. My what the, I'm a better Christian now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Exactly. Than I was five yeah. years ago after 20 years of trying. Exactly. Yeah. The second that I took responsibility 
and called it what it is, which is my own health ownership of behavior Fuck. and responsibility to the people around me. Right. It suddenly, I just wasn't a thing I wanted anymore. It didn't make sense anymore. The flip side is that you're now responsible. You're now way more responsible for how you hurt other people. Oh also. my God. Oh my God. And you know, what's crazy is the weight of the shame of what I did that led to the destruction of my marriage mm-hmm. was so much heavier and emotional. The consequences of it and the way that I experienced those consequences were so much heavier to me, once God was out of the picture, mm-hmm. then they were, because mm-hmm. before I was like, oh, well, you know, God's fucked up a lot of lives for his glory and the good of his people. Mm-hmm. He fucks up a wow. lot of stuff. He's killed yeah. millions of people yeah. for his Fuck, glory and the good yes. of his people and the wow. good of his story that he's telling in the world. So this is just, I'm, this is just another, you know, like I'm always wow. like, hey God, like, like ultimately I don't have to bear responsibility <sighs> because it's not really, I mean, I, I, I need to own, I mean, I need to personally own you know, my behavior, but ultimately it's like, nah, dude, if you really believe that God works all things according to his will in accordance with his glory and the good of his people, God damn it. If that's what you believe, <laughs> then you know what? Ultimately, guess what? Evangelical friends, your problem is not with me. Let me blow your mind. Right, right. It's with God. Right, right. God did this. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I'm just saying like, Let's take all that shit to its inevitable conclusion. Yeah. I'm not trying to skirt responsibility. I take all of it. I did it, you guys. Frick. I did it, okay? Yeah. I did. Yeah. I did it. I did it willfully. I was a fucking asshole. I was, a, I was an imbecile even. Yeah. And yet, ultimately, God is responsible if he is do if, if ultimately if. all things are for his glory and the good of his people, yeah. no, no less than he governed and orchestrated putting the ultimately the, the the ultimate worst thing that's ever occurred if you believe yep. which is the sinless man on the cross taking responsibility for the sins of everybody that's the most heinous bullshit you know like evil thing that's ever occurred and yet god perfectly orchestrated it right. and talked about how he was going to do it for thousands of it years before it, yeah. it was the it's the economy of salvation yeah. i mean and i mean you know jesus wanted to betray I mean, Jesus, Judas wanted to portray Jesus. He did it because he loved, he, he, he wanted to. And yet without him doing it, it wouldn't have happened. God orchestrated every last, Martin, as Martin Luther said, even the devil is God's devil. Damn. Everything is under God's dominion. Ultimately, God, mm-hmm. he does. I mean, even in Psalms, it says, God even says, I bring good and I, and I bring evil. Right. Ultimately for my glory and the good yeah, of my people. Yeah. But I, I, nothing, I use every part of the buffalo, God says. Yeah including me fucking up my marriage. Right. And so it's like, ultimately, it was so much harder when I was like, oh, wait, this wasn't part of some plan to bring the creator of the universe glory and the good of all these people. This was me being a fucking asshole yeah. and not seeing and completely betraying the people who matter more to me than anybody. Yeah. Shit. It hit me. Suddenly, it was all my responsibility. Mm. And I feel it and process it that way. And it's like, I feel like I started, oh, my grief started over. Oh, wow. Once God yeah. was gone. Yeah. Because I was wow. like, oh, shit. Oh, wow. It's just me here. Yeah. And this is on me. And I did this. And I'm responsible for it. And I have to take responsibility for Fuck. it. And this is, and now I need to live in a world where I can, I, well, this will not happen again. Shit. And I, you, know, you know what I mean? Like, it's yes. a whole other deal. I mean, yeah. On the way here, I was talking to Chuck. Uh, um, yeah. And I was like, you know what, Chuck, I bet you Derek is an immense guy and not an apology guy. Uh, because you talk about responsibility, and I think the difference for me this year is a big thing for me of like, I'm going to take amends for what I've done amends, wrong. That's right. And I'm going to t- take responsibility for take those responsibility. things. Take responsibility. Because Ownership. really what Christianity teaches us is you do whatever the fuck you want, and then you say, I'm hey, sorry. Hey, forgive me. You, you do an apology, but you don't, Y- yes, you, well, you and can then be the guilted person, into changing. The other person is obligated to forgive you. They're obligated to forgive you. And so there becomes a cycle of abuse for a the lot of people. The ultimate example of that are the men in this town. When I was, as for my own recovery some years ago, was like making amends and reaching out to some people who I'd lied to and betrayed and 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 deceived. And I was re- you know trying to make amends for that. It mm. was probably too soon. And I think some people were still too shocked and too disappointed in me. But in an effort to do it, one of the responses that I got from somebody who is a pastor in this town said to me, um, I hear what you're saying and I know that I'm obligated to forgive you because Jesus has forgiven me. And so I know that forgiveness is an obligation for me, but let me tell you what else I know is that 
God forgives me, Jesus' forgiveness is as, goes as far as my sin goes. And I, I know it would be sinful for me to withhold forgiveness from you, but I can't forgive you. And so I will go on not forgiving you and asking God to go on forgiving me for that. What does so, that even mean? So I don't forgive you. And I know that I'm forgiven for that was the answer. The fuck? And I thought, huh. I do appreciate that he was honest in one way. It's he, honest. Mental gymnastics. You know? But I mean, that sounds Yep. But just what like you're saying about taking circle. responsibility of like taking responsibility for what we do and right. to make sure it doesn't happen again for real and not because of an obligation that we have to uh, something that we have no evidence of, but that we do have, we take responsibility for what we do have evidence for. That is one another. Right. That is the empathy that I have right. for you that you have for right. me. Because and you can sneak around on an external influence that you're ultimately like trying to appease or trying to live in accordance mm. with its will. You can sneak around on that. What you can't get away from or sneak around on is your own gut and yeah. your like y your own behavior and your own responsibility yeah. for who you are owning that. It's completely changed the way I behave in every way. It's revolutionized my ethics and my morality. Yeah. And it's actually to, to the point that, you, we, that how we got on this rabbit trail, but it's, it's actually made me, it has not made me less moral. It has made me more moral. Right. Because it's which, more of Which is what you were saying. Like, oh my God, once God's gone, is it just kids running the candy store? You know, like right, what reason right, would right. I have to do anything it's, good oh, so much if, more, if I'm deconstructed, yeah. then it's just yeah. fuck it. I do anything I want. Yep. Actually, it has made me vastly more moral yes. in, in a more sustainable way because mm -hmm. I am taking responsibility and I am owning what I do. I'm making those amends. I'm keeping short receipts because it's me and it's you. And therefore I need to, and it's I, not just in the, neg in the negative though. I find myself more often going, interrupting a conversation to say, hey, I'm not giving thanks to anything external for how grateful I am for you being here with me right. and the experience we're having. So I'm going to look at you and I'm going to come and I'm going to hug you. I'm going to say, thank you. Right. Thank you for being here now. Thank you for being with me and staying with me. And thank you for the conversation we're having. Thank you for being in my life. I have no one to thank but you. I had this. And therefore upset. I'm going to do, I'm going to do it all the time. I'm, it makes Shit. me more loving. It makes me more. Yeah. Cause I'm like, I want to say it because you're the only people I have to say it to. Right. Who else do I have to thank for right. this? But you. Damn. On an even you know? more fundamental Damn. level. It's a better way to live. And Damn. everybody yeah. tells you that it's not. Yeah. On an even more fundamental level, I had this really important existential moment during my deconstruction where I was sitting on my back porch, which is where a lot of like yeah. important things come to me, you know, on this back deck. And I was looking at this tree that I love that's in my backyard. And I had this moment where I was like, I can appreciate this tree for being a physical tree in front of me. I don't have to see God in the tree to love it. It doesn't have to be a metaphor for anything. No, it's, it's just, just a beautiful a, thing that beautiful lives tree. and exists right there. And it's I can just be, right I can just there. go and there it is. It's so simple. So I wanted to, yeah. I wanted to ask you that, and this is related to what we're talking about. So you, um, sort of one of the points I think that you really wanted to make in almost every episode of your, of the first season of your podcast was, uh, like you deconstructed your faith and a lot of people ask the question, who am I now that I've lost this thing that I identified myself with? And the answer that you give is I'm me. I'm right. the same person I've always been. Can you see me that way? Is it okay for you to see me that way? Even though like God is not a part of that. I don't believe that the God that gave me identity was real. So it's been me the whole time. That's exactly I right. I haven't changed. And that's the same metaphor for how you communicate with your own body. Right. It's like, I am the same. If you liked me before, you like me now. Because I am all that's ever been here. Mm. Right. Right. Yeah, this is like, it. I'm, I'm all there ever has been. If you liked this before. Then you like it now. You're getting more I mean, of like, it. There's not, there's no difference. Right. There's zero difference. It's exactly right. what it was before. Right. Because the thing that's gone is not a th real thing. Right. So there is, there, nothing is absent now of me that yeah. was there before. Right. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. And, and, but that's like, it's so simple when you put it in that sentence, mm -hmm. but it's so mind blowing when you realize it. Right. You know? But I think that's the crisis that people experience. It is. Because at first you literally do it's illogical because if you're starting to think, oh my God, I don't think any of it's real. I don't think God's real. I don't think what, G I don't think G I don't think I'm not, I'm not sure any of it's real now. 
And oh my God, what does that mean? And it's like what you don't really think about or the way you're, you can't yet think about it is, oh, actually nothing is different. <laughs> Nothing's changed. You're right. Because right. when something that was not on this table gets removed from this table, what's left? Precisely what was here before. Right. Right. 100% exactly yeah, yeah. of what was here previously yeah. is still here. Uh-huh. And so, but it takes you a minute to do the logic of that, to be like, wait, God's not gone. God was never there. Mm -hmm. If he's not here now, he was never there. Mm -hmm. Or if he left me, well, that's just a whole other can of worms. Right, right. But yeah. Which is like where the end of the record goes is like Uh that untrue binary statement of Mm -hmm. either you're not real or I'm not chosen. Right, right, right. Yeah. Yeah, well, yeah. Which is God, really how I feel. Me. That's the emotion. I hate binary statements, but that's, that's the, the, emotion. the emotion of it's yeah. binary. Emotion. Yes. yes. It's like in yep. this moment, there just is not a third option for me. Either it's none of it's real, well, or, I love the, or it is real um, and I'm on the outside of it. I'm just mm-hmm. always looking for your replacement. Yes. It's like, that's like that, that's that, but that's still that binary, but that's the that's right. feeling until you accept. And that's when you know you're coming into reconstruction. Yes. And you're no longer preoccupied with, with, um, uh, uh, putting a king back on a throne. Right. Oh, shit. right. Say that again, please. I need to hear that again. Yeah. That was so good. Yeah, when you know that you're coming around the turn of reconstruction, mm-hmm. when you're reconstructing something, is when you stop, when you lose the preoccupation with there needing to be a king on the throne. Fuck. Right? And you realize, oh no, like I am, I don't need saving. Yeah. And I don't need permission. And I don't need justifying. And I don't need, I'm, I am, I embody it. Yeah. I have it. I had it the day I was born because here I am and I exist and that's it. And I, it's all right here in my body. And, but like people, I mean, that's why a lot of my friends, and I don't know if this is where either of you are, or maybe some of the people who are listening, I'm okay if this is where you are. It's just, it, it doesn't make sense to me. And I'll, so I'll be upfront about it. I'm also, it's also a hypothesis. It could be real, but I feel like some of my friends, because they need a reverse gateway drug, they move too quickly from let's say evangelical Christianity to the universe. Mm-hmm. Sure. Okay. Yeah, yeah. It's really just another name the pers- for a thing that the they desperately need universe. to exist. Right. Yeah. They need there to be something intentional and meaningful yeah. and external of them. That's a force and, and, and uh, uh, something that they can bargain with, communicate to, right. ask things for, yeah. put hope in. And I'm like, I don't know, maybe, <laughs> right. but I don't know that saying, Hey universe, or, yeah. you know, I don't know that that's any easier or right. actually that makes a lot less sense to me. Yeah, yeah. There being just a nebulous universe that, but yeah, I mean, of course the universe is a thing it that's exists. out there, yeah, yeah. but like it being a thing that has will and volition right, and right. intention it's, and it's benevolence. In some way. And I don't, that doesn't make any sense. sense. It being random chaos out there swirling around and stars fucking crashing into each other. hundred yeah. percent inarguable. I, I love the beauty in nihilism. There's, yeah. n- there's nothing. There's just nothing. Me too, actually. Can it just be chaos? <laughs> Can the fact I that mean, yeah, kind ca- of. Chaos is, the, like, chaos is the most superior like, form of the universe. Yeah, it's like, like what Pat Oswalt says about his wife who mm. passed away. Like yeah. her God. argument was. Yeah. It's all chaos, and so be kind. Yes, right. Like right, right. your your protest against the chaos that's yeah. actually the prevailing energy in the universe is to be kind. So either it's all chaos, mm-hmm. or there is a God who is both all loving and all powerful, and he's just a fucking asshole. When I was right. watching, but it's that gotta, kind of got to be one of the two. That's what that's what Pat Oswalt said. And I love, I love it. I, love I that, had to honestly. pause it. I had to pause it when I was watching a special on Netflix after he said that the, the the universe is chaos. Be kind. I just paused it. And I was like. Oh, shit. That's right. I know. It's incredible. It's incredible. And, but that, you know, like, but that kind of, then the point we were making and we were circling was the idea of too quickly supplanting a king for another because you're just, your muscles are so trained to de- to mm-hmm. depend mm-hmm. and yep. to lean yep. upward. Yep. It's like, nah, man, right here. Uh-huh. Get familiar with this right here and this right here. Uh-huh. Me in my own body and me in proximity to you and your body. Right. This is the negotiating that we need to be doing. Yeah. There, we don't, like, don't be too quick. Like, try and work to be okay for a second 
to not have to have something out there yep. that you can identify yep. with and depend on and God, just see how that feels for amazing. a second. You might come back, yeah. but give yourself a second to objectively look at the boat you were in yeah. before you jump from one into another one. There's three virtues that I, or I'm going to call them virtues that I feel like you've talked about today. And those are vulnerability, um, intuition and empathy. Hmm. Uh, if, if you had to add any, that are very important to you, what would they be? And do you have any advice for our listeners who are starting the reconstruction or going through? And then we'll uh, end. Uh, to those, those are good words. And I appreciate, I'm glad that somehow that came out of all this, whatever I've been doing, but <laughs> all this coming out of my mouth. For the, but I would say the things that feel important to go with those, say them one more time. Vulnerability. In, vulnerability. Intuition. And empathy. empathy. I would say... And maybe these are the same thing, kind of, but ownership and responsibility. Oh, shit. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, yeah, like, yeah. I think those are super important to go with those. Right. Fuck yeah. Like taking responsibility, yeah. you know, owning, in other words, owning the consequences of mm -hmm. whatever your choices are while you are being, trying to have responsibility and, and be empathetic and be intuitive um, and, um, and being vulnerable you know, owning, you know, making choices and taking responsibility and ultimately taking ownership of those choices. I think those I are important. That. And I, and I think, cause if you're not doing that, you're not ever gonna, I, I almost think vulner or a, a responsibility and ownership are almost required for empathy mm. because if you're not yep. doing that, yeah, then you don't know yeah. yourself and your own experience well enough to be able to say to somebody, I've been where you are. I failed in the ways that you have, and therefore I am occupying the same real estate you are. Mm -hmm. And therefore I am, we are a safe place mm -hmm. for each other, or mm -hmm. I can understand the world. I don't just understand it as I imagine you see it, but I see it how you see it. Wow. I can see it the way you do because I have also taken ownership and responsibility for my own story. And so I think you have, you have to do those, but the, the, I think if I had any like advice in D or reconstruction, it would be, Ultimately, I, I think my instinct is to speak to people going through deconstruction. Sure. I think is my instinct. That, that feels Go like the it. riskier moment. Yeah. Okay. When you're still not sure if the results, if if the conclusion that you might wind up on means being on the outside of a circle of where, like, I think there's a real fear in spiritual deconstruction because the stakes are so high because if I do this, and depending on where I land, I it could mean being parted from my loved ones for the, all of eternity. Mm -hmm. Yeah, mm -hmm. it could mean being eternally separated from mm. God. Uh, you know, like being like the reconstruction. I think is more a practice of luxury because you're kind mm -hmm. of because by the time you're because reconstruction presumes deconstruction. So it's like the hard part is detaching from the thing that gave you all your security and hope and finding new targets. Mm -hmm for those things is the super hard part. The easier part, it's not easy, but the easier part is tr measuring and looking for things that now ring true in the absence of those previous things. Uh -huh. And the, the stakes are just lower because now I don't think I'm like trying to find my way back into heaven anymore because I yeah, just don't yeah. think that's how things work. Right. I don't think that's a place. I don't think that's a thing. So the stakes are so low. Now I'm like, how do I make the most of, if this is all there is, how do I live a great life Yeah. and, and yep. be a great parent and be a great partner and be an ethical business person yeah. and, and, and not waste a second of my life doing anything that's not the few things that I'm great at doing. And yeah. it's, it informs in every way the way that I move forward. But the stakes are different because it has nothing to do with eternity yeah it's just about how do i steward right now yeah how do i live extremely present and steward every second and enjoy and risk but take responsibility yeah. for every second that i have right now and so i think the harder part is the deconstruction and so what i would say to people and what i th what i ultimately i think cracked open for me to fully deconstruct um was this if you find yourself still persuaded of, or, or at least more curious of, or still muscle memory leaning on God and Jesus and evangelicalism, 
and that's really what you're coming out of and you're t- terrified about deconstructing it for where it might take you. But what I would say is either what's on the other side of it is that God is there and he is what you hoped and he is both f- f- completely good and completely powerful and all the promises that were made to you were true and that even your vulnerability about what you believe and where you are, even that cannot pluck you from Jesus' hand. Right. Jesus said, nothing can pluck those who you've given me, Father. No one can pluck them from my hand. Those who you've given me, no one can take them. Nothing can take them from me. It's in Romans 8, that litany yeah. of all the things that cannot separate you from God's love. Right. All the things. And it's an exhaustive list. Uh-huh. There's no risk of you having come up with the one thing that was not included and right. not in the mind of Paul when he wrote that, right. that could separate you from God's love if it's real. Mm-hmm. If it's real, mm-hmm. you, are at, there is, you are in no peril to pull it up by the root and examine it and get to the bottom of it and come back to it stronger and know for sure and mm-hmm. have a reason. You, you, you are, so in other words, do it. Mm-hmm. Because what's on the other side is either... In other words, if God's there, then he is equal to or more powerful than your most intense doubt. Right. And you are not going to challenge his reality or his existence by your doubting it. So, because either you're going to find that he's really there, he's really good, he's really powerful, and he really loves you, and you were never at any point in peril. Just like if you cut the Psalms in half and you stopped it midway through, that would for sure be a guy who was apostate and going straight to hell. Right. But the story is long. And by the end, that was not his story. Yeah. So be open to your story being longer than you suspect. And maybe on the other side, God really being there. Yeah. Right. So you'll either discover that or you'll discover that it's not true. Yeah. And the promises were not real promises because no one really made them to you. And all you have is you and your relationships. Yeah. And all you have is, is the, the present moment that you can take the most of, take responsibility for. And wouldn't, and, and the life that that might inspire in the way that it has me and the way that it's completely changed my life and my behavior and my fulfillment and my joy and my freedom and all the things that Christianity advertises, but never seems to really deliver, at least for me, wouldn't you hate to have missed that life just for fear of having questioned it? Mm. It's the a reverse only Pascal's fear. wager. Yeah, well, kind of. <laughs> but the only danger is in not questioning. The right. only danger is in the fear of the deconstruction. Right. The deconstruction right. is of no, you're, you're in no danger deconstructing. Yeah. Because either it's real or it's not. And don't you want to know either way? Right? I do. I do too. <laughs> so that so that's my that's my that's what that's I would beautiful. that's my that's invitation. Beautiful. That's my you know that's Thank what you. I God. Thank you know like do it. Yeah. Because either God's <clears throat> real and he'll he's there waiting and he was with you the whole time or you're real. Or you're real and he was never with you and find and, out. And get born. Find mm. out. You know? Beautiful. Get born. Damn, thank you. Derek, thank you so much. Oh yeah, it's a pleasure. This I've been was, looking forward to this it. This was so much fun. This was so much fun. Oh, we always end our episodes with a, with a stupid little slogan. It's a benediction came, of sorts. A benediction, Let's do it. yeah. And that is... Um, if you don't go to church, Sunday is, is just, just a second Saturday. Saturday. That's exactly right. There we go. <laughs> I love it. Wonderful. Thanks, Thank Derek. you so much. Oh, it's a pleasure. Woo!